Hi everybody, welcome to the June CAM cycle monthly meeting. Uh, very happy to have you here, especially when that weather is so tempting outside. Uh, but if you're watching later on, um, catching up on YouTube or Facebook, thanks for, for joining us then as well. And this evening we have a, a good friend of CAM cycle, uh, someone we've worked with for, I'll let you say how long, Mike, because it was since before I joined CAM cycle. Um, but Mike Davies, well known to CAM cycle previously as the head of cycling projects for the county council. Um, but now in a new role working on sustainable transport for Cambridge University. And that's what we're here to talk to you about today. So I'll stop talking and I shall hand over to you, Mike, and we would love to hear what it is you're up to with the university. Thank you, Mike. Right, thanks very much. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I've entitled the talk, Building on Already High Levels of Cycling um, at the University of Cambridge. So um, gonna be a few introductions and then I'm gonna talk about our transport strategy some of the initiatives that we're rolling out and some new ones as well. Something about our work on infrastructure. I'll then talk about Eddington. And then I'll just uh, say a little bit more about Let's Talk Transport, which is our engagement campaign of which this is a part. So a little bit about me. As Roxanne says, um, I was working for the County Council um, in a variety of roles for about 32 years actually, but the last 14, I was involved with cycling projects, uh, managing the team, getting funding in, and um, trying to sort of push the agenda forward. And I, I'm proud really of that period of time because um, I think when I started to get involved, I think we had levels of cycling in Cambridge at about 18%, and they lifted during my time there up to about 25%. So um, some good progress was made, I felt. And I did work closely with CamCycle and other partners I was looking back, I think I was your AGM speaker in 2010, so that's quite a while ago. And also, just as I left in 2019, uh, you very kindly gave me this award, the Public Officer of the Year, so thank you very much for that. And I felt that sort of rounded things off nicely. Um, and then I joined the University of Cambridge in 2020, February, about five weeks before lockdown, actually. And I was keen actually to look for another opportunity to broaden my transport knowledge and working at the university has been very interesting in terms of getting involved with things like bus contracts, electric vehicle charging, um, autonomous vehicle trials and all sorts of other things as well as cycling. So it, it's been a really a, a great opportunity for me. So I'm part of the sustainability team. Um, it's about 20 people and we in turn are part of the estates division, which is about 300 people strong. And it's responsible for all of the new building projects, all of the maintenance of existing buildings across the university estate. But uh, within the sustainability team, we have a transport team, uh, there's six of us. Uh, we also have a carbon and energy team and an environment team. Um, and that's us. We, we met up about a month ago, having not seen each other for about a year for a very brief litter pick, uh, which was quite interesting. And we did find two bikes. It's another story. A little bit about the University of Cambridge. Um, I, I think it probably is Cambridge's largest employer with 12,500 staff. There's also 20 students at 31 colleges. And university sites are spread fairly far and wide on the west and south of the city. There's 372 buildings. Some of them are very old. Some of them are very new. Three and a half thousand car parking spaces. That's quite a bit of land use. But we also have 13,000 cycle parking spaces. So, so that's pretty good. Um, some of them are not great, but um, you know it's pretty impressive. The whole organisation is over 800 years old and it has growth plans. Back a stage. So um, I'm just going to talk about the transport strategy. Um, so the, the way that sustainable transport is being delivered at the university is very much in the context of carbon reduction, 
um, the, the whole sort of green agenda and meeting the university's objectives around carbon reduction. Um, in 2019, Cambridge was the first university to commit to a science-based target for carbon reduction. And that target is to reduce energy related carbon emissions to zero by 2048, with a steep 75% reduction against the 2015 figure by 2030. And so there are a number of strategies and resources to support them in place. And the strategies cover things like carbon and energy, sustainable procurement, sustainable food, biodiversity, construction projects, and recycling and waste, and of course, transport. So that, that's the context of how we're tackling transport. So the strategy was launched in September 2019, and the focus is on staff travel to work. So it, it's not really about students as such. Um, it has a number of aims and commitments, and these are clearly set out. So there are commitments around walking and cycling, around electric vehicles, around public transport. And the target is for 75% of staff to travel regularly by sustainable modes. In other words, only 25% of trips by single occupancy car. Now this is monitored um, in October every year through a staff survey. Uh, we do give out a couple of cash prizes to try and encourage a high take up. And last year we got a 29% take up. It's pretty impressive. That's about three and a half thousand responses. Each year we seem to be getting more responses. Um, in terms of the governance of the strategy, uh, we have a, um, a champion, if you like, Professor Ian Leslie. He's the senior advisor to the vice chancellor with special responsibility for environmental sustainability. So Ian really oversees and champions our work. And we also have a transport working group. And this is the committee that we take um, proposals to and get budgets from and discuss issues. And that's got a broad representation, including HR, finance, um, people from different parts of the university. And that in turn is a kind of a subcommittee of the Environmental Sustainability Strategy Committee. So we have a fairly robust governance system. So how have we been doing? Um, so this graph shows, uh, we, we have a lot of data going back to 2009, showing our, our progress. And you'll see in 2009, we actually started in, in quite a good place with high levels of cycling fairly low levels of driving. But I think like a lot of employers in Cambridge, we've gradually seen more and more people moving further afield. People finding it hard to live and work in Cambridge and people are commuting quite long distances. So that's something we're having to work hard at. And we're looking at solutions to that around multimodal solutions, sort of park and cycle, park and ride, that sort of thing. Um, but you'll see that 2020 on the right there was a very interesting year. So the survey was undertaken in October. At that time, we had 68% of staff working from home. And obviously we, we then achieved our target um, of less than 25% of people driving in. The next couple of years, I think will be very interesting because working from home typically accounted for less than 1% in the survey it's very likely um, that working from home, agile working, hybrid working will be broadly adopted across the university, certainly the administrative parts. And I, I fully expect that figure to be around 20% um, in the coming years. So we will achieve our targets, but we will need to set ourselves some new targets and we'll need to think very carefully how we do that. So, one thing we're very interested in is, is the barriers to taking sustainable modes such as cycling. And we do in, invite comments as part of the survey. It's not simply a tick box. We do ask for people to sort of talk about what their barriers are. And here are some common barriers. Um, and you'll see on the left, there's a photo of the bottom of Castle Hill. 
I think that was taken in, in the 1950s. There's even a horse there. Um, but, you know, they, these were just normal people commuting to work. But I think the big change, really, that we've seen over the last 50 to 70 years is people moving further away. Um, but it's just really um, about trying to break down these barriers. You know, what, why are people still driving? Do they see changing mode as a, a sort of a difficult thing to do? How much extra time does it add, add to their day? So, um, okay. So to try and encourage sustainable modes, particularly cycling, we, we do roll out a lot of initiatives. Um, like many employers, we have the cycle to work scheme. Uh, we've got a limit on that of £3,000. Um, it, it did increase in the last couple of years from £1,000. That does enable people to consider buying, a, for instance, a Brompton folding bike, e-cargo bikes. Um, of course, that £3,000 includes equipment as well. So it can include things like trailers, cycle seat, cycle carriers, you know, for children, helmets, jackets, panniers, all of that stuff. So I, I think, you know, 3000 really does open up the possibilities for people. We also have a cycle loan scheme. Um, that loan scheme also allows people to buy season tickets on public transport as well. Uh, we operate Dr. Bike, very popular, um, currently operating at West Cambridge and the biomedical campus. We typically do 32 slots per session. And I think we're doing the sessions every two weeks at those locations at the moment. Um, we do offer cycle training. It's very hard to get people excited about cycle training, however you badge it up or however you promote it. But it is nonetheless there. I think it's important we promote that uh, because we do have other things like pool bike schemes. And so we, we need to offer the training alongside all of that. Um, so we also have, um, as I say, a pool bike scheme. We recently added three e-cargo bikes to that scheme to help specific departments with certain needs around moving goods around the city. Um, this was part of the wider GCP City Council application, I think, where 30 e-cargo bikes came to the city. We managed to get three of them. Um, but we do have these rather nice bike hangers in various locations where the bikes are accommodated. And we have a maintenance uh, contract in place, so the bikes are always in good condition. And there's always the option to get waterproofs, helmets and things like that from reception at the nine locations where we have these bikes. So we are just about to roll out some new, what we call return to workplace initiatives. I think as people come out of the COVID pandemic, people returning to work is a good time to target people in terms of thinking about how they might travel. And so we're, we're launching a borrow a bike scheme. And I believe you've got speakers next month talking about a very similar scheme. And uh, basically this allows people for as little as 10 pounds for up to three months to, for instance, try a Brompton, an electric bike, a cargo bike, or just a hybrid bike or city bike. And they'll then have the option to buy it at the end of that period. So, you know, trying to break down barriers and say, come on, have, have a try. It'll only cost you 30 quid for three months. We've also secured 41 cycle lockers at park and ride sites um, on the fringes of the city. And we're now in the process of pairing up these lockers with members of staff. And these will be given free to people for a year so that they can park and leave their bike securely at the park and ride site with all of their kit and then ride in the last couple of miles. So I think that will be a great scheme. We've also enlisted a team of travel advisors to provide personalised travel planning. Uh, now, this is literally uh, filling in a quick survey of how you currently travel and then having a one to one 30 minute interview with a specialist travel advisor who, through um, motivational interviewing techniques, will try and um, guide and persuade people to consider other modes or to try other modes or to think about things like car sharing, multimodal trips, but it's really providing that personalized information together with a follow-up and lots of surveys as well to hopefully gauge uh, the effective, effectiveness of this kind of intervention. It's, it's worked well on new developments and some other workplaces. 
And then also lots of publicity around our existing initiatives, a bit of a relaunch of some of those. So just to talk about cycling infrastructure now, um, from our annual surveys, we've gathered quite a lot of information which points us to, to really find out that improving cycling infrastructure will probably get more people cycling, whether it's having showers and lockers at your workplace, better cycle parking or cycle routes. And some of those cycle routes are on university land. So what we did, um, we, we put a brief out to some consultants and commissioned a very in-depth study of the whole university estate. As I say, we had 387 buildings, I think I said earlier. And uh, this involved site surveys, photographing, and analysing the condition of all of the cycle parking, the lockers, the showers, any cycle routes that were on our estate as well. Um, this was all put into a very comprehensive report and a, then a prioritised programme was put together, um, a budget was identified for the improvements and we're now in the early stages of rolling out the delivery of these improvements. Uh, we're putting the detailed designs together and in many cases planning consent, sometimes listed building consent, various other approvals are needed, certainly where we're, we're providing a covered cycle parking next to a historic building, for instance. So we're hoping this summer we'll actually start the delivery on some of the Downing site, which is in the centre of Cambridge, and the Sidgwick site, and we've also got some installations at the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. Uh, so just a little bit more detail here. This is the Sidgwick site. So that's Grange Road on the left, Sidgwick Avenue running along the bottom of the screen. And you'll see that this kind of site, we've got a lot of different buildings, a lot of different departments, and there's a lot of different areas where we are uh, removing wheel clamps, uh, adding toast racks and covered cycle parking, um, and a fairly comprehensive review of that whole site. Some other infrastructure, um, we are putting a programme together to remove barriers and chicanes. Uh, we do still have a few of these in various parts of the university estate. We're also looking at cycle maintenance stands as per the photograph there. We've, we've uh, put various ones in over the years. This seems to be the most robust unit. Lockers, showers and drying space and just last week, we signed a legal agreement to bring voice scooters and e-bikes onto West Cambridge and Eddington. So they will be appearing soon as well. And I think, you know, that's a, another option for people as well. Some other related interventions. Um, we've, we've done a review of our car parking policy. We've still got a lot of consultation to do with staff on that. But we're, we're looking at a fairer policy um, to reflect various needs and um, perhaps lead to, in time, a, a reduction in car parking that's available. We also fund the Universal Bus Service, uh, which operates between Eddington and the Cambridge Biomedical Campus. Uh, we are looking to retender this in future, and part of that retender is, is very much a quality bid, and we will be looking certainly for operators to, to look at consideration to perhaps taking bikes on the bus um, off peak, certainly allowing folding bikes during the peak and just looking at a much more flexible approach so that we can work towards more of a, a joined up mobility service between bus and bike. And then partnerships, very important aspect to us. Um, the university's um, been working with CamCycle and others on the cycle theft initiatives um, that's one example of a partnership, but we also um, we also have a voice on the GCP and we have engagement with the combined authority and local councils. And, you know, we, we try and fight the university's corner for better infrastructure, taking into account the comments we've had through our um, annual survey, um, certain junctions and routes to, to university sites that we think are important. Just a quick word about Eddington. Um, there's been a lot of talk recently about 15 minute neighbourhoods and 20 minute neighbourhoods. And, and I think Eddington is a really good example of this. 
Local trips can be made very easily on foot or by bike and soon by e-scooter as well. Um, more and more shops and services springing up all the time at Eddington. And then for the longer journeys back into the city and over to Addenbrooke's, uh, there's the Universal Bus serving Eddington and lots of cycle routes as well, uh, largely off-road linking back to the city centre. Um, so we work very closely with the other site occupiers in Eddington to make sure they all have uh, active travel plans. The school, for instance, has recently achieved its target and now has about 65% of its trips by sustainable modes. So we provide a lot of support there. This is the Transport Stakeholders Group. Um, it meets about every six weeks. Um, so you'll see on the bottom left, we involve all of our suppliers of services like the car club operator, Outspoken who do the doctor bikes and the borrower bikes and Whippet who provide the bus service. And then we bring along um, the site occupiers. So Girton College, uh, Residence Association, people from Sainsbury's, the nursery and the school. Campsite also attend. Um, Matt Danish comes along to that. So um, we're, we're closely working with stakeholders there towards a, a truly sustainable development, we hope. So let's talk transport. This is part of that campaign. So what we've been doing is really reinforcing everything we've currently got on offer, launching some new initiatives, We've launched a st another staff survey looking in, in even more detail at some of the sort of barriers to sustainable transport. And from that, we've gathered people together into like-minded groups, such as people who want to talk about cycling infrastructure, people concerned about bus travel. And we're setting up a series of kind of workshops with those like-minded souls. We're, we've also offered people one-to-one -one chats with the transport team if they have particular concerns. Uh, that they prefer to air outside of a group. So it's very much a listening exercise. Um, so, you know, as I say, we're trying to gather in, in much more detail what are the barriers to using sustainable transport. And all of this is a very useful set of data feeding into our new transport strategy, which will be launched in 2024. Thank you very much. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, Mike. Um, thanks so much. And um, just showing us how much work is being done across the university to move to sustainable travel modes or increasing the amount of people using sustainable travel modes. Uh, so I put this to our followers, um, the people who are watching on Facebook, um, on Zoom or uh, keeping along with the uh, live tweets on Twitter. <laughs> so we're covering all fronts. Uh, but Mike, I've got a quick question for you. Um, you mentioned these transport conversations and I'd be interested to know how is the university working to ensure that new and diverse voices are being heard in these groups? Uh, you know, anyone who works in this, in this world in campaigning in transport knows that there's lots of people who are really keen and get involved, but perhaps there's people who haven't even realised they've got something to say um, until they're asked the right question perhaps. So, um, how are you working to, to bring those new voices in? Yes, I mean, that, that is a challenge. Certainly, we, we don't want to get around the table with, with the same voices all of the time. It's the new voices that I think are really interesting and, you know, can unlock some new ideas. Um, one of the things we, we're particularly keen on is, is people who are less mo mobile and perhaps have mobility issues. And we've teamed up with the university's uh, Disability Resource Centre and they, they have also put out some communications, emails and so on to some of their network to try and bring in some other voices to some of the more sort of intricate issues, reasons why people can't physically get onto a bus or they have uh, you know, difficulties waiting at bus stops, that sort of thing. Um, so so that, that's one of the examples. But we do have a lot of communication channels and a sort of network of green champions and people like that that we've tried to get the word out via. Um, I'd be interested to know, how does the university define sustainable travel? I mean, are, are electric vehicles in or out of that? And if you've got this target to 
reduce uh, single occupancy vehicles, is there pressure on those targets because of the, the growth of electric vehicles? What role will, will that play on? Yeah. I think that is an interesting question and we uh, the way we've looked at it to date is really anything other than a single occupancy car other than an electric one well sorry including electric ones so um, for instance we're currently classifying motorcycles as sustainable transport although I'm I'm looking to do a piece of work to kind of see what others are doing on that um, in terms of other universities, other large employers and councils to see what their view of that is. Um, at the moment, anyone traveling in an electric car on their own would still be classed within that sort of 25% group that we're, we're, we're not keen on. <laughs> um, however, if they were sharing, then they would be classed as sustainable. Um, so uh, I think this is one of the things we will review as part of the strategy going forward, it, that some modes are actually much more sustainable than others, for instance. Uh, I guess that leads into a question we have from Guy, um, and he asks, how much of the travel policy is about the climate emergency versus consideration of supporting health of staff students through active travel? And I'm going to jump on the end of that and say, and how much of it is about it freeing up land or keeping land free from car parking so it can be used for other purposes? Well, I, I mean, all of those things are important. Um, Organisationally, the way that we're coming at this is from an environmental sustainability perspective and how this contributes to achieving carbon reduction targets for the university. However, in so doing, it does have a large range of other benefits, two of which you've touched on there. Obviously, um, the health of staff, public health, um, staff arriving for work, not having sat in a car for two hours, feeling rather frustrated, having walked or had a pleasant cycle ride, taken some exercise, uh, that will make for much more productive working. Um, and yes, land use is, is very important as well um, to provide a thousand car parking spaces when that could be repurposed for um, a, a tree planting or, or a pleasant space for staff to sit or, or uh, more useful buildings. Um, you know, car parking really isn't a great use of space, particularly in, in the city centre. Uh, but we do have to recognise that, you know, there are contractors coming to site off, often in vehicles. There are uh, disabled users, there are car sharers, um, you know, there are people coming for meetings still in cars. So it's getting that balance really. Uh, and we've, we've had a few comments coming in um, on this issue. So so Guy has, has a, said that consumption of land was absolutely um, his follow-up question. Um, and so he's, well, before we get to that, um, Stuart has then asked, if we can spare land from being turned into car parks, how can we prioritise car parks for those who need it? And at no cost, should we prioritise um, free car parking for anyone or for certain certain groups? What's the university's attitude on you know, those situations like contractors or perhaps people with, with certain disabilities who, who will need to drive? Well, the, the current car parking policy looks at a number of categories. So... Um, it, you know, as I say, it, it is currently under review and subject to a lot of consultation. But for instance, people who live further away and can make a case that they can't easily access public transport can get car parking. Uh, people who have caring responsibilities and perhaps need to drop children off and that sort of thing can, can make a case for car parking. Um, but certainly, yes, contractors, people who have to use their vehicle as part of the working day can get car parking and it's prioritized based on sort of where you sit within that list um, but as i say there will be a, a review of car parking so I, th I think this is something that will change um, many other universities do charge for car parking uh, cambridge university currently doesn't it, it may well in the future and that's again all subject to public co uh, staff consultation um, so Guy then has also followed up with um, 
uh, he says it, it's interesting to think about listed building consent being needed for bike storage while many beautiful parts of the city have cars plonked all over them. And I guess that tied into a question that I, I, I noted down is, is what are these challenges that you might face when we're dealing with some very, very old and precious buildings? Um, how hard is it to get these improvements really? Uh, and I guess, are people objecting to that? If, if they say, well, we prefer the wheel benders, they're historic, I'm not sure. Yeah. What's the challenge there? No, I, I think this, this has been an issue in the national press recently where residents have provided car parking shelters in their front gardens and then the planning authorities told them they had to take them down in a street full of cars. <laughs> um, but no, I, I don't see it as a major challenge in Cambridge. It's just that it's a, another process that has to be worked through. I think the city council planners are very sympathetic to sustainable transport. They do have to strike a balance and there is a process to work through. Um, but, but I'm not aware that we've had any specific issues with getting any through it just adds a few more months to the process that's all do we have enough space does the university have enough space for all the cycle parking that will be needed um, if if you reach those lofty ambitions or do you need more people to work from home in order to fit the cycle parking well, when we as i say we are going through a, a period of change now because up until the pandemic, less than 1% of people were working from home. Now, suddenly, we, get, we are invariably going to have a change. That's going to change a lot of considerations within the university's estate um, about the use of space. I mean, maybe we don't need as many buildings for administration activities. Um, so the, the whole estate may well change in the next five years. Um, and yes, specifically on cycle parking I think you know one of the issues with the current estate is that often we we seem short of space and it's a bit too difficult to go to a two-tier cycle parking solution and we all know that you know that works for some people but not everybody and as I say we we want to move to a an inclusive approach to cycle parking and recognize a different types of users and different abilities and different types of bike. So I, I think we are pushing to try and retain a large percentage of Sheffield stands and only really go to two tier when we really are stuck for space. So Mike, how has the, the university been able to get away with some pretty shoddy cycle parking for so long? Is it, you've come in and you're, you're ready to change it all, but the fact that there are still you know, bikes hanging off walls and in wheel benders or just left in, in those little ditches that we see, um, well, how have they got away with it? <laughs> first of all, I, I'm not gonna take the credit for this because, um, Things were already in motion before I arrived. So, um, no, I, I mean, I think it's, yeah, some, some of this cycle parking has been around for a long time. I know a lot of people have been, yeah, making a lot of noise for many years, but I think, you know, the university does listen and I think it wants the staff to travel sustainably. And so it has recognised this, but it, it's done it in a, in a very measured way by, you know, having a very, very thorough review developing a, a you know a very sort of hundred hundreds or so pages of, of document you know to um, see what's needed and prioritize it and and then then to actually get on and do it but yes it's taken a while I'm sure once we get some new stuff in that's going to build momentum even more um, and you know I'm sure it'll be really well received but yes it, it takes a while it's an organization that's over 800 years old so you know we need a bit of time. Fair enough, as long as we're, we're on the right track. Um, so while we're talking about cycle parking, uh, I guess we have to touch on cycle theft. Um, so, so Mike, you and I, we both sit in the various stakeholder groups about cycle theft. Um, so we're aware that there's some, some work going on as partners, but could you perhaps elaborate a bit more on, on what the university um, is doing or hopes to do around cycle theft? Um, and I guess I'd like to touch on the cycle parking is, 
what issues has your audit uncovered that could perhaps influence cycle parking standards and policies going forward? Because we know we've got some gaps there. Mm. Yeah, well, as I say, it, it's been a very comprehensive review of the cycle parking. Some of it really, the stuff out there is terrible. You know, it's even concrete blocks with a, a little gap where you put your front wheel in some of it. A lot of these sort of butterfly stands. Um, so, you know, work is underway to to address all of that. Um, as you say, I'm, I'm part of the partnership with yourself and the City Council. We will be looking to promote the Save Our Cycles materials internally as well. Um, we've had various promotions on and off through the years around uh, giving out D-locks and that type of thing. Um, many of our sites are covered by CCTV as well, and we do have staff on site, sort of security staff. Um, again, rather like the Save Our Cycles, we, we encourage everybody to uh, report the thefts, um, know their frame numbers, register their bikes on bike register um, and photograph their bike. All of all of those things so you know we will be encouraging that as part of this campaign as well um, we do have some of the cycle parking um, is also the sort of caged site type cycle parking where you need access to get into it on some sites um, so you know that that's really good you know the real sort of exemplar standard as well uh, but yeah i mean quite honestly we, we need cycle parking for everybody the visitors um, you know, um, right across the estate, but but we are improving greatly. Great, thank you. Let's move away from cycle parking for a minute, although I think we might get more questions. Um, but Claire asks, or says that the one-to-one -one travel advisors sound like a great idea. How are they chosen and trained? Yes, a good question. Um, so we, we wrote a brief and we, we did go out to tender for this work. Um, and the company who've won it, um, Steer, Steer Davis Cleave, um, have some experience of working with the university. They actually did the cycle parking review that I was talking about. And they also did some work on a car parking review as well a while ago. Um, some of the staff who were involved in the earlier piece of work on cycle parking are, are working on this. Uh, we also had an intern a couple of years ago in our team. Uh, she then joined Steer and she's also one of the travel advisors. Um, I think all of the travel advisors have either worked for the university, worked on a university commission, or they went to Cambridge University and thus lived in Cambridge. So all of them do have a, a, a good knowledge of the transport system, but they've also been provided with materials from us um, and all of the bus timetables. And so if they can't directly give the information, they are able to sort of follow up. I mean, th these can be considered as a sort of travel buddy, really. It's the start of a one-to-one a -one kind of travel relationship. So it may be that the conversation is, well, I'll need to go and find that information for you and get back to you. So they, they have a pretty good knowledge, but I'm sure, you know, uh, a, the odd gap will appear and um, they can follow up on that. Um, that makes me think of, of um, earlier in your talk when you mentioned the barriers that um, people identified in the survey. And, and there's clearly a task to, to help eliminate those barriers. Um, so it's easier for people, but also is that a case of people think they're barriers, they're perceived barriers, and that having a bike buddy or a travel advisor might overcome that. How much do you have to work around the barriers or challenge people's perceptions of those barriers? And how do you go about that? Yes, I, I think it is trying to make a change, isn't it? And I think um, often when... Um, people start a new job you know we one of the things we're doing with this personalized travel planning is we're, we're working with HR to target all new starters because I think that's a good time when people are ready for a change if you like also anybody who's going through an office move perhaps moving from you know the Downing site out to West Cambridge for instance uh, the transport options will be entirely different so we'll be really targeting those people as well um, but yes, I say it, it's a travel buddy. 
it's a lot of it is about encouraging and, and positive stuff. But equally, um, by taking things away from people, you, you can encourage change as well. That's a bit harder. But, you know, I'm thinking about car parking and, you know, that that's a reason that people might have to come to this sort of service as well, because maybe their car parking application was unsuccessful this year. And so they're having to consider other options. So there's a kind of stick and carrot way of doing this. Uh, so Monica um, asks about uh, cycle routes on university sites um, and would like to know if you could say a bit more about what is planned um, and what about routes between university sites. Um, and I guess then as part of that travel advisor, will, will they provide advice about routes from one site to the other? Because I guess it's not just about people cycling to and from work, but it's where do they need to go as, as part of their work? Yes, I mean, that's a very good point. I mean, there is a lot of travel within the working day, uh, historically at the university, pre-COVID. I think um, the new way of working, a lot more meetings will be done in a kind of hybrid style with, you know, some people there in person and some via Zoom or Teams. But there will be a lot of uh, travel within the working day uh, between the sites. Obviously, um, things that are within our own estate, we can influence. So we are, for instance, looking at removing some of the um, chicanes that are in place on the, the cycle route between Maddingley Road and Stories Way that goes near to Greenwich House. Uh, so we're looking at that. Um, but much of people's journeys is on the public highway network. And all we can really do is, is carry on working with our partners so, for instance, um, we also did a student survey this year and they said that one of their biggest barriers to um, sustainable transport was potholes. So I, I contacted the county council, the directors there just to say, you know, we've done this survey and this is what the students are saying. You know, if you want more of them to travel sustainably, you're going to have to tackle potholes for cyclists because, you know, it, it, here's the evidence. It, it is an issue for them. Mm. Uh, so, Mike, I guess there's this sense of, OK, what's the university doing for people who are, who are coming to their site? But but actually people or the university fosters this um, Cambridge bubble, I suppose. And there's lots of spin offs. There's lots of things going on. But that means there's developments further and further away from Cambridge so that we have enough housing for all these people who work here. And some of those journeys are quite challenging. So what role does the university play or should play in helping those people coming from further out as well? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we are looking at, um, you know, as I say, we, we, things like car sharing, trying to match people up, but we, we have been talking to Stagecoach and other public transport operators about um, different offers and discounts that might be available. For instance, um, Stagecoach had now offered a flexi rider ticket. Uh, previously, they had a monthly ticket. Um, but given that some people will only be coming to the office perhaps two days a week, the flexi rider, I think, gives you seven days travel out of 28. So, you know, at the moment, a lot of people wouldn't want to buy a monthly pass. But, you know, they, they've Stagecoach have listened to the larger employers and said, actually, something like a flexi rider would be quite a good option for people. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, we've, we are fairly limited in, in what we can offer for people who live further afield, but we are, again, we're, we're listening and we're trying to, you know, work with other partners to, to put some sort of offer on the table for them. And I guess there's getting people to work, but the university, you know, it's attracting people from all over to Cambridge, but they bring with them their families, their partners, their hobbies, there are other interests, there are other reasons for travelling. So should the university or is the university applying any influence over what happens within new developments, uh, not just to get to university, but to help people get about their day to day life? I know the university has has more say over what happens with Eddington, but, but can you exert influence on other developments? Well, I, I mean, Ed, Eddington, um, perhaps actually Eddington by by sort of leading by example, you know, to show that um, we can get really high levels of walking and cycling. We can impose very tight restrictions on parking, for instance, which is what we do at Eddington. Um, 
it, people are very much encouraged not to own cars. There's a car club, there's a regular bus service and cycle routes. And, you know, other developers, I'm sure, are very interested in Eddington because people who live in Eddington say they like it. It seems a very vibrant community. Um, and so in a sense, you know, it, it can be sort of held up as an example of, of best practice in that sense. Um, you know, it's a pleasant place to live and, and work and move around. Yeah, so we've got to keep promoting what's good about Eddington, promoting the lessons learned to help to guide future developments. Um, but I, I'm sure, Mike, you probably can't say it, but I'm, I'm sure everyone in Campsite would love to see the university being bolder and stronger in, in pushing for more sustainable transport in, in areas perhaps outside of their direct influence. So we'll plant that seed there. <laughs> Moving on to a completely different topic, uh, Jim Chisholm, of the Chisholm Trail um, has asked what has happened to clocks. So that's the construction, logistics and community safety on university sites. And, and Mike, perhaps you could tell us a bit more what is clocks and, and what's happening on university sites? Um, well, clocks uh, relates to delivery vehicles and construction vehicles um, being sort of cycle safe and having wing mirrors and reversing bleepers and cabs designed so that you can see cyclists easily. Uh, a, a lot of work was done in London on this and is still being done some excellent stuff. Um, I have to say, I think the best answer for me to say back to Jim is I don't know. Um, I, before I joined the university, I, I believe the university did um, write into contracts and things like this, that the vehicles had to be designed in this way and had to be sort of clocks compliant, but it's not something I've been involved with. Um, you know, there are large major projects on West Cambridge at the moment, like the Cavendish Lab. Um, I could certainly find out for Jim to see um, if, if that's been written into those contracts. Um, but yeah, it, it's a very good scheme, but I, I don't know is the short answer really. That's fine. When you do know, if you could let us know and and perhaps then, Jim, if we're not happy with the answer, we can write some letters um, and, and make sure that's that's written in. Um, we've got a few little, uh, questions um, left over. Um, so Guy has asked, what is the Dr. Bites scheme that you mentioned? Um, and then did ask, does it show people how to find and record their frame number? So. I will jump in very quickly and say that later on in, in the meeting, I will talk all about our Love Your Bike campaign, encouraging people to register their frame numbers. And Guy, you've given me a great idea that we'll make sure that the Dr. Bikes have our leaflets with this information. Uh, but Mike, could you tell us what are Certainly. Dr. Bikes? What are they doing? Um, currently, the Dr. Bikes don't do that. However, um, we are coming to the end of our contract with our current supplier and we're rewriting the contract spec. And we have put in there that we would like the new supplier to um, show the person where their frame number is and then get a laptop out and actually get them to register the bike on bike register. So that's, if you like, one of the outcomes of the partnership work that we've done um, you know, on save our cycles. So <laughs> um, it just so happened that the contract was coming up for retender and we thought actually, no, that would be a great opportunity to do that. But currently the doctor bike is a sort of 20 minute bike check over. They will put new cables and brake blocks on for you and that sort of minor stuff and then point out if there's any more major problems on the bike. So it's really a safety check, but it is free and you can go onto the sustainability team web page if you're at the university and book a session. Excellent. Um, and I'm amazed it took this long to get this question, Mike, but it's come through right, right at the end um, <laughs> from Andrew. Can you tell us about the new trial electric self-driving buses on the West Cambridge site? What is the scheme all about? And can we be confident the self-driving system doesn't pose a threat to cyclists. Don't know how much you know about that project, Mike, but what can you yeah, say? Yeah, I do a bit. Yeah, I mean, the, the university's role in this, as much as anything, has been to allow the trial to operate on West Cambridge because West Cambridge is private roads. It's not part of the public highway. Um, but it's really a Greater Cambridge partnership and a number of other organisations led piece of work. 
and they have some sort of funding. I, I don't know the details of it, but I have seen the, the buses or the shuttles. Uh, the first one, the Union Jack liveried one appeared, I think last October. Unfortunately, they became victims of the pandemic. And I think they operated for one week in October around West Cambridge. And in the early week, um, the vehicle has to sort of learn the route is, is what I'm told, has a number of sensors and it, it's driven around West Cambridge to learn the route. Um, however, um, after a week, it was stopped because of the pandemic, then restarted a little bit before Christmas and stopped again. And then I think it, it sort of took off properly again in April with the second vehicle added as well. So their plan was certainly to have a, a, a period of learning the route, a period of a driver driving it, and then a very short period of driverless operation. Um, again, a full risk assessment was in place um, and all the issues of, well, what happens if it comes up behind a cyclist or if a pedestrian walks out, all of those issues, it seems had been addressed. But I believe the trial does end at the end of June. Um, all of the learning, I'm sure, feeds into the next phase. Um, but as I say, it's really a Greater Cambridge Partnership led project uh, rather than the university. We're, we're sort of uh, facilitating it, I suppose. But nonetheless, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. And, you know, whether it in due course will lead to shuttles, perhaps. I mean, personally, Cambridge North Station to the Science Park, a regular shuttle that you just hop on could be quite interesting and useful and equally the Maddingley Park and Ride to West Cambridge could be another one but you know I think we're we're still many years away. Yeah excellent well Mike I think we shall wrap it up there but um, if anyone has more questions you can either send them to me and I'll pass them on to Mike or if you're on Twitter Mike is there as hops and cheese um, and also post excellent pictures of cycle touring holidays and so on. So <laughs> worth the <a> follow. <laughs> but Mike, I'd like to say thank you so much for coming and speaking with us this evening. Really fantastic to hear from you. Fantastic to hear about the university. And we're just so happy that you're still here in Cambridge doing great work for cycling. Um, that award was well deserved. Um, and thank you for keeping up the great work. <laughs> well, thank you. As I say, I'm part of a really great team here as I was at the County Council. So, you know, um, it's all, all about teamwork. So. Absolutely. And those you. partnerships, isn't it? And we, it's Absolutely. nice that we're seeing some action happening through, through that cycle theft partnership at the very least. Uh, Mike, you are very welcome to stick around with us, but we also won't mind if you, if you want to jump off and, and get into the hops and cheese. Um, but if those watching um, stick around, I'm about to pop up our presentation and do a couple of quick updates about um, what else is going on for cycling in Cambridge. But uh, Mike, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks everybody. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Okay. Uh, right, so some general updates for June. Now I've left this picture on from our May monthly meeting, but who can resist um, having a photo that celebrates new infrastructure, particularly when CamCycle member Simon just looks so fantastically happy about it. Um, but on other issues, uh, we have the results of the election now um, and things have had quite a big shake up. So in case anybody hasn't heard the news, uh, we now have a new mayor for the combined, combined authority that is Mayor Dr. Nick Johnson, um, and he's from the Labour Party. We have the County Council with no overall control, um, and that's there's become an alliance of sorts or a green coalition, which is Labour, Lib Dem, Greens, and Independents. Oh, actually, there might not be Greens, that's the City Council. So, um, but we have a, a coalition there at the County Council, which means there could be a bit of a shape up in how things work there. Um, and we've also had the Police and Crime Commissioner elected, that is uh, Daryl Preston from the Conservative Party, who I met with today to talk about cycle theft. Uh, and we also have um, a number of new councillors with the City Council as well. So what we're working on right now is determining what next, what are the big things that um, we're asking um, 
asking these uh, newly elected councillors um, to focus on what do we think the priorities are. Now that there is a big shake up, it's really important that we, we have a think. So if you've got thoughts, if you'd like to get involved, do get in touch. Um, what we're trying to do is come up with our top five or top 10 points um, for each of these bodies. So the Combined Authority, the Police and Crime Commissioner, the County Council, and the City Council. So do get in touch and we'll keep you informed as we develop that. And I will confirm there are no Greens on the County Council. I just, I had a moment, I'm very tired today. <laughs> but we did have new Greens elected at the City Council. Right, so uh, the next thing to let everybody know about is we now have the LC WIP consultation. What is an LC WIP? It is a local cycling and walking infrastructure plan. And this is for the county, it's for Cambridgeshire. And it's really, really important that we engage with this consultation and we need to get out beyond Cambridge City. We need to get right across the county and get people contributing their ideas about cycling. Where are their gaps? Where should there be new routes? Um, what's working, what isn't? I will admit I haven't had time yet to, to have a proper look at this, uh, but once we've managed to get in, we'll, we'll do a summary and we'll share that with members. We'll put that on our blog, but please go and take a look. I'm sorry, I don't have a short link for this yet, um, but if you go onto the County Council website, I hope you will be able to find it. If you have any issues, uh, just let me know. And hopefully someone who's watching the chat can pop the link in there so people can click on that and go straight to the consultation. But very, very important that we, we get involved in this consultation. Uh, also um, happening next week is uh, the Greater Cambridgeshire Partnership. We're, we're back in action um, after PERDA and so on. Um, now things are happening again and there's a big shake up because of all the changes in the various local authorities. Um, the proportions of the GCP Joint Assembly and the Executive Board will be a bit different. So worth keeping an eye on. Um, the next meeting is on the 10th of June. It starts at 11 a.m. And then there's an afternoon session that should start uh, at 2 p.m. or possibly a bit later if things go on too long. On the agenda is public transport routes between Water Beach and Cambridge, uh, public transport between for the Cambridge Eastern Access Project, but we both of these still have implications for cycling, so worth looking at. There's the audit of Camborne to Cambridge schemes and there's the Cambridge South East transport scheme. It's all thoroughly confusing. It's my first day back in the office since these papers were released. So I will put my hand up and say I haven't had time to look through it all yet. So do go and um, have a look. Uh, you can find the agenda papers on the County Council website um, or you can get there from the Greater Cambridge website. I haven't shared a link because it's just long gobbledygook. Uh, so that's one that I think you'll have to go and, and look up or hopefully we can get a link in the chat for you there. Um, there's some complications now with public meetings. So before the pandemic, they were held uh, in person and we often had to find ways to get to, to Camborne um, with odd hours by bus and so on. Um, and the, the pandemic meant that everything went online using Zoom or Teams. And to be frank, it was much, much easier as a member of the public to engage with those meetings. However, the government hasn't updated their guidance for local authorities. Um, it, it, they, the old arrangements of going online had an expiry date. The government's not made any changes. So we've gone back to the old, old process and that is in-person meetings. But in-person meetings still can't be held as they were because we've got um, COVID guidelines. So long story short, it's very hard to engage with uh, public meetings at the moment. The council is saying they'd rather you don't attend the meeting and they will live stream on Facebook if you wish to observe. I don't quite know what this means for asking public questions. I think it means someone else will have to read it out for us at the meeting if we're unable to attend. And I, for one, have no idea how I would really get to and from Duxford um, to ask a question. I guess it's a long bike ride. Uh, so anyway, that's my little warning to everybody who wants to engage that it is a little bit of a mess at the moment, but Camp Cycle will be doing our best to represent and to explain to everybody what is going on there. 
Also, uh, for your campaigning radar, we've got some campus expansions. So the Cambridge Biomedical Campus is uh, starting to have conversations about their vision for 2050. That's the link cbc-vision.co.uk. Uh, and we've had some members involved in early conversations with the Biomed Biomedical Campus about their plans. It involves much more expansion, significantly more people traveling to that site. Of course, that means there are implications for the capacity of the Cambridge South Railway Station but has that actually been considered in Network Rail's plans for that station? So we definitely need to be taking a look at that for all transport, but also cycling. Early days yet, we'll try and get more information out to members as we work that out. Also, a uh, new uh, expansion for the Cambridge Science Park. So there are plans for Cambridge Science Park North. Um, Again, there's not that much information about this yet, but we've got some meetings in the diary to find out a bit more in the coming weeks. We shall share that with members. But if you go to the Cambridge Science Park website, you should be able to find out a bit more about what is planned for the rather large Cambridge Science Park North, which I think is potentially bigger than the Cambridge Science Park that we currently have. So again, lots of implications for transport there and are we seeing the joined up thinking that we need to see between the various schemes that are being developed, um, perhaps not realizing just how many people they should be accommodating in the transport system. So we had, uh, we touched on this in, in the chat with Mike, but uh, CamCycle has launched the Save Our Cycles campaign, which we hope will have a dent in the rates of cycle theft. I'm going to be honest to say this is not going to solve the problem, but it is something that we as individuals can control. So Save Our Cycles is saying, if you love your bike, lock it and log it. And we're giving people advice on how to securely lock their bike. And we've actually seen in the chat today uh, that Stuart has said, CamCycle and local Facebook groups have encouraged me to register my bike and get de-locked up to the eyeballs. Um, I wish it wasn't so, but I also am de-locked up to the eyeballs um, on my bike because I am worried about it being stolen. So we're giving people advice to make sure they're locking both wheels um, and the frame to a secure cycle stand and that perhaps they should be using two D-locks to do that. We're also asking people to register their bikes and to make sure that they have noted their frame number. Um, and this is because through the stakeholder group around cycle theft, speaking with the police, we've uncovered that it's a really big gap in their ability to, to do something about cycle theft. Uh, when people make a police report about their bike being stolen, if they don't have a frame number, if they don't have proof of purchase, it can be really challenging. If the police did go and look at the CCTV, did catch the, the person who stole the bike, they may not be able to actually prove the crime because there's no evidence that that bike was owned by the original owner. So it's really, really important that we get everybody to, to get that crucial piece of evidence so that if they do have the unfortunate need of having to report a cycle theft, that evidence is there to tie the bike to the person and to show that that bike has been stolen. It's also very helpful if you register your bike, it means that if somebody else finds your bike, they can track you down um, and hope may be able to get your bike back to you. We do see a number of bikes abandoned, thieves forget where they are, or somebody else sees a bike for sale on Gumtree and has a suspicion. So it is really helpful. People can go onto bike register, put the frame number in, and, and if the bike is marked as stolen, they can go, aha, uh -huh, I will contact this person and help them get their bike back. And I am hearing more and more anecdotes of, of this type of thing happening. It's also a way to deter thieves because the thieves now know that we're registering our frame numbers and we can track them down. So thieves are actually checking frame numbers, we believe. And if they see that that frame number is registered on bike register, if they see that that frame number is registered as being part associated with a stolen bike, we have seen thieves dump bikes. So it's still not great. You've probably still lost a lock and still had the drama, but perhaps it increases the chances of you getting your bike um, back. 
Uh, and actually, I imagine that people might even start checking frame numbers before they even go to the effort of, of, of breaking locks. So if this is one way that we can help deter thieves, we should be doing it. Um, and we're recommending bike register just after working with the stakeholder group, we found that this was the easiest to use, the most widely used um, uh, and just seem to be the best one to recommend. And the more people we have on the same system, the better. But that doesn't rule out um, using other registration sites. The police should be checking all of them. By all means, register on multiple sites if you like. So as part of our campaign, we have bought out, as I said, the Love Your Bike leaflet. And these are going out to all the bike shops in Cambridge. We're getting them out to community centers, workplaces, cycle parking facilities. We've got posters as well. Uh, we're getting them out to schools. We've also sent out digital resources so people can print up their own posters. They can send information out in emails. Uh, and we've got lots of social media graphics that people can use as well. All of that can be downloaded from our website at camcycle.org.uk forward slash cycle theft. But if you would like some of these for your workplace or your school, or you'd like to help get them out in the community, please send me an email and we shall get some leaflets to you. And I've already asked the police and crime commissioner if he would help fund the next batch of printing. So if we run out, don't worry, we'll get some more. So our campaign has been a great success. We had three pages of coverage in the Cambridge Independent newspaper last week, and I've been told we can expect some more this week as well. We were even on the front cover. Uh, so we're certainly getting the message of cycle theft out there. Uh, we were covered by Road CC. We've been shared by a continental international cycle tire brand on social media. We know that schools are sending information out to parents. Uh, the word is getting out there. Um, and uh, if you aren't sick of hearing me speak this evening, well, I've even managed to get a video on YouTube this week. Amazingly, when Anna's been too busy to do it, I've, I've worked it out myself. And there is a video now on our YouTube channel, which shows people how to find their frame number on their bike if they're not sure where to look. So you can use that, share that as well. So please everyone help us get the word out. We really want this campaign to be huge, but rest assured, we know that this is not the, the magic solution to this problem. And we're working on many, many other fronts as well, which we touched on with our chat with Mike. Um, and in other great campaigns, if you haven't seen it yet, the Bike is Best campaign brought out a new video uh, about choosing the right tool for the job. Um, and this is Kevin, he's uh, features in the Bike is Best video, uh, and I think makes a great case for uh, a giant SUV, or as we call it in Australia, a ute, uh, is not the best tool for getting your pint of milk home. So if you Google bike is best, I think it's bikeisbest.com, uh, you can watch that video and it's quite entertaining um, and a nice light note to finish the meeting on. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, really appreciate that you've, you've joined in. Um, thank you again to Mike for his fantastic talk and we shall see you in July. Thanks everyone, bye.